Well, panellists, I'd like to introduce, which we met uh, yesterday afternoon, is uh, Chris Metcalf. So I'd welcome him to the stage. Chris farms on the south coast of Western Australia with his parents, Richard and Christine, and brother Tim. And they run a mixed farm enterprise of 18,000 acres, with cattle being their priority and a large part of their business. They run the Coogin Hills Angus Stud, as well as 1,500 head of commercial cattle and they have a mixture of 70, 30 Angus and Murray Greys. They aim to produce 2,000 grass-fed cattle to Woolworths in the spring of 2023, targeting the 270 to 280 kilo carcass. So welcome Chris to come and find a, a chair. Next panelist I'd like to introduce is uh, Frank Archer. Frank has a passion for improving productivity and profitability through improved grazing management, refined cattle management and the use of appropriate genetics. And Landfall supplies bulls to its client base in most states of Australia with two on property annual sales. So welcome this morning, Frank. <laughs> the next panellist I'd like to introduce is Nolene Branson. Nolene has been fortunate to be involved with the Angus breed all of her life. Her parents started an Angus stud in 1971. She completed the National Junior Angus Herdsman's Contest at the Angus Beef Classic in Wodonga in 1986. She was invited to join the Victorian State Committee in 1987, replacing her father, and she served on that committee for, for that entire time. Along with her husband, Stephen, they founded Banquet Angus in 1991, and that has given them great opportunity to develop relationships all over Australia and overseas. They now sell two, over 200 bulls annually through auction and private treaty, and they've seen their bulls go to every state in Australia. So, welcome, Nolene. <laughs> Next panellist I'd like to introduce is uh, Forbes Cameron. Forbes left uh, school in 1964 and started farming and shearing. By, two, by 1969, he was in partnership with his brother and they saved a deposit on their first farm. Twelve years later, they went their separate ways, but he's bought and sold various properties since then and now they farm over 2,000 hectares, 1,700 effective hectares with their, their son, Angus, running around 18,000 stock units. They started their Angus stud in 1999 and presently have 300 plus Angus cows. They also have two sheep studs with approximately 2,000 ewes. Therefore, spring is very busy with 300 cows, uh, 300 calves to weigh and record along with 4,000 stud lambs to be weighed and tagged. It's a good work ethic, Paul's. Welcome this morning. <laughs> Next panellist I'd like to introduce is Heath Tiller. Heath is a, a fifth generation cattle producer from South Australia who operates the Goolagong Angus Stud and HB Rural Feedlot with his wife Jenna and parents Brian and, and Deanne. Their properties are in the mid north and southeast of South Australia. They, the the Goolagong Stud was formed in 1979 with Santa Gertrudis cattle and in 2014 the stud expanded to include Angus. Since then, the Goolagong, Goolagong stud has increased to 400 head. For the first time, Goolagong had an annual, uh, an on-property sale in the southeast to complement its mid-north sale. Heath has a strong interest in not only producing quality stud animals, but producing well-bred animals for the HB Rural Feedlot to produce a quality beef product for domestic and export markets. I'm glad that Heath has quite an interest in uh, and Angus Genetics moving into Central Australia. Welcome this morning, Heath. <laughs> Next panellist I'd like to introduce is uh, Nick Boschhammer. Uh, Nick founded his, uh, his own stud, um, NB Genetics, in 2014 to improve the beef supply chain that, and to produce a more efficient beef production system. NB Genetics is owned and operated by Nick and his wife Kate near Chinchilla in the Western Downs of Queensland. He shares a strong passion and dedication for improving meat quality. 
is a second generation Angus bull breeder. His family will hold the 32nd Sandon Flannock Angus sale in August this year. He's a graduate of uh, Marcus Oldman College before furthering his uh, education in Kansas State University. Welcome this morning, Nick. Our last panellist this morning is uh, James Laurie. James uh, probably needs a little introduction um, to the room. He's uh, one of our directors and our current vice president of Angus Australia. He's a fourth generation uh, beef farmer from the, the Barrington River at Moffey, west of Gloucester. They're surrounded by the Barrington Tops uh, National Park. They farm uh, 2,300 2, hectares and a, four, uh, and a further 400 is, is leased. They were traditionally Devon Shorthorn Cross breeders and they founded uh, the, the Angus that was established in 1995. So welcome um, this morning, James, and thank you for being part of the, the panel this morning. I'll kick off with a question to, to each of the panellists and then uh, we'll have some general questions any stage, um, one of you might like to ask another panellist a question or, or dig a little bit deeper. I'll have a good chat and then we can ask a few questions from the, the floor. Heath, um, I'll start with you, mate. You have a number of bulls going into those drier Central Australian pastoral zones. What feedback are you getting from your clients about Angus working and foraging in, in that sort of tough environment? Yeah, that's a good one, Scott. Um, yeah, we've been getting selling bulls up through the northern pastoral areas, up around Onondaga, uh, William Creek, Burnsville now for a number of years. And the main thing they say, they've got to be able to walk and, and, and be able to get across a lot of the ground and have good feet. And, and it's working very well and the breed's doing a, a tremendous job for them with a lot of crossbred cattle that they have up there, like, a lot of bosinicus and all sorts. And, um, but yeah, that's doing a very good job for them and performing. Thanks, Heath. I might pass the microphone to uh, Forbes. I will um, just add that um, each of the panellists this morning, I've, I've been able to have a, over the last year quite a, um, a good interaction with. I, I think I've um, visited you all with the, with the exception of uh, Nick and um, they're, they're a great bunch of breeders and um, I've just really thoroughly enjoyed the conversation with, uh, with each of you. Forbes, uh, you run a, a, a very different operation. Would you mind telling the, the audience um, how you've been breeding an Angus cattle uh, towards a low import approach? You, uh, I believe, uh, work towards only two lifetime drenches and, uh, in, and resilience to internal parasites is very important. So you might like to uh, tell us a bit about that, Forbes. In, in, in New Zealand, um, the Drench families and the Lemmets are breaking down. A lot of people have got major problems. Um, we've been doing drench resistance in our sheep since the 1990s. And we test a lot. We do only two lifetime drenches in our sheep. If they need more or if they need uh, dipping or fly control, we cut them. Uh, and we're, we're using the same approach with our cattle, basically. So um, cattle that we retain, like our bulls for sale and heifers that go in calf, they get a third drench in a lifetime, but uh, cattle that we're finishing, uh, we're finishing about 300 to 320 kilo carcass weight in uh, sort of 20 to 24 months, they only ever get two drenches. And, um, if they need a, any, anything on our farm that needs any extra treatment for anything uh, gets its head cut off at the end of the day. So it's, it's, a tough, it's a reasonably tough regime, but it's working for us, and we've got big demand, particularly for our sheep anyway, because the drench families just, and there's no new chemicals on the market, so it's pretty, pretty serious. I've had the um, privilege of visiting uh, Forbes uh, on his farm and he's, he's got a lot of hill country in, in uh, um, the North Island of New Zealand. We had, uh, I think, a day where we did 13 kilometres on a, on a quad 
um, Forbes and I on a quad, it's quite a sight to behold. <laughs> Forbes, you might um, tell us a little bit, a bit about how you, when you started, you started. It's uh, when we say hill country for Australians, I don't think most of us grasp the, the steepness of that that country. Um, you might uh, share a little bit about um, what it was like starting out. I think uh, you told me at the time you might have started with 20 heifers and 10 of them never made it to the end of the season. Uh, when we started, there was quite a few uh, Angus dispersal sales in New Zealand. If we went, if we went to a sale and bought 20 from one start and 10 from another, by the end of most most Angus studs in New Zealand are on a lot easier country. By the end of the first year, if we had 50% of what we bought still alive. We were pretty lucky because they fell off. Most of them fell off the hills and just couldn't handle our conditions. So. But the ones that hung in there, they're okay. <laughs> it's extraordinary hill country. It's so steep. But and when he explained that they actually fell down and died, they, they it, and it's and the country it's literally that steep, isn't it? It's the tough, tough country to um, um, and, and you need know, cattle that can thrive in that environment. Nolan, if we can um, pass to you. I visited uh, yourself and Steve, and uh, you had a, we had a conversation over lunch um, about why you decided um, to breed Angus, Angus cattle, um, particularly Steve. So would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, thank you so very much for including me on the panel this morning. Um, I've been very fortunate to be involved with this breed all my life, and uh, when I was a teenager growing up, Angus cattle were referred to as the poor man's breed. So that's how I started in the industry, um, caught, um, getting all that backlash. How times have changed now. Um, we set out, when Stephen and I started in our own right in 1991, uh, we were fortunate enough to spend seven weeks in New Zealand. Of those seven weeks, we spent six weeks um, doing cattle properties, looking at Herefords and Angus. And uh, during that time, we realised we wanted to uh, introduce the New Zealand type of Angus to Australia. And with that in mind, we actually import, oh, bred a female in New Zealand and imported three females to Australia. And one of those females we brought across, um, the Tasman, was actually Banquet Kiwi Dream M41, which has been the foundation of the very successful Dream family in Australia today. So we, we noticed um, our market in our area, being Southern Victoria, a very um, strongly held Hereford area, and to tap into that market we needed to produce an animal, uh, Angus animal we wanted to breed, that consisted of a good head, a lot of bone, a lot of capacity, um, so that we could try and um, yeah, put the Angus bulls into these Hereford programs. Um, so that's how we started. And to this day, we still enjoy what we're doing. We get a lot of pleasure um, in sourcing cattle all across Australia and New, Ze New Zealand still. So that's where we're at. Thanks, Nolan. Frank, um, if we can move to you. Um, I visited your property and, and uh, it could be some of the nicest um, Soft grazing country in Australia. It's a it's a it's a lovely environment in the, in the north of Tasmania there. But I was struck by the fact that you uh, sell wolves into nearly every environment, don't you, Frank? Would you would you like to um, elaborate on how your um, cattle, which uh, uh, you breed in in a in a softer environment, perform when you send them across Australia? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Scott. Um, it's an interesting question you pose because Tasmania can be perceived to be a soft environment and it is a wonderful environment to grow cattle. We have a, we have a mild climate, uh, we have relatively high and reliable rainfall, so um, how we manage um, the development of ge genetics in our program is through the development of a really sound production system and that production system is based on us understanding what our clients are doing with their cattle. So um, we create some pressure in our environment through uh, having, we run a high stocking rate, uh, we have restricted joining periods um, and we have large contemporary groups. So at the moment we have 
um, eight to ten month old bulls run in mobs of up to 350. So the um, relevance of our genetics is created from the fact that there's some pressure in the system and the things in Tasmania that make it a wonderful cattle environment are also some of the reasons why uh, we can have a tougher environment, particularly the winter, so a, a higher rainfall and a mild climate means that we have a real feed deficit in the, in the winter, so managing the winter uh, and making sure that um, we can have our cattle producing but with adequate pressure on them so we can uh, really soundly identify the outliers on either end of the, the performance spectrum. Thanks, Frank. We move to uh, Chris. Um, question for you um, is, when we're in Western Australia, we, we often hear about the Southern Rangelands. We, um, there's a move uh, to push Angus cattle further in to what must be seriously one of the most extreme grazing environments um, that we've got in this country. Um, would you uh, like to tell us um, how do you see the progression of Angus into that, um, that hot, um, pretty harsh, nearly arid environment and, and how, what's, what's your perception of how Angus are performing there? Yes, Scott, so it's a pretty new uh, push for both Angus and our business, I guess. We were sort of experimenting with sending uh, seed stock up into that area. So southern rangelands is, is sort of in the middle of Western Australia. Um, it traditionally was sheep, so heavily run with sheep and, and they've smashed the perennials there. So basically now it's salt bushes and, and sort of poor quality grasses there. Um, the, the rainfall sort of 200 mils average, but that can be a bit higher and it can be way lower. So it's a pretty tough environment for cattle and it's, uh, there's a lot of short worn uh, drought master cross type cattle. So it's a, it's a very new thing uh, new, and, and like MLA are doing a, a little bit of a study on it. They're sending steers uh, up into the Murchison uh, region. Um, so they sent a truckload of steers and that's just a new trial. So they're trying to figure out how those Angus steers are going there. So I don't have, I can't answer too many questions about that. It's, it's still ongoing. Alan, Alan Peggs is, is running that. Um, so from our point of view, we, we have a client in the, um, the Goldfields region. He's near Leonora. Um, and he approached us and we, we started with one bull a few years ago. Um, and he likes a, a specific type, like Heath, Heath was saying, he wants um, something with a bit more leg, something that's got good feet, something that can kind of carry itself over the saltbush type country. And then his target market is, um, is he sells the calves into South Australia, he, they're low weight, sort of like 200 kilos, um, and he gets paid a premium on coat colour, so a slick coat animal is, is very important to him. He, I think it's like 80 cents premium he's getting on those slick coats. So that's a real focus for him. Um, I guess a challenge is, is the, uh, those rangier type of cattle that he wants of how well they actually do out up there. So that's a bit of a new thing for us. So after that one bull, that he worked, and then we sent half a dozen the next year, and then the last load we sent was 15 or so. So we're still sort of figuring out how though they go and work in his system, and um, I guess his management style um, and and the harsh conditions. They're, they're sort of, so he's sort of running three to four thousand breeds up there. So it's still a bit of a work in progress for us to figure out how they're going to go up there, I guess. It's a very exciting project for the West Australian Angus Group, isn't it? They're very um, um, excited about that push into the north and, and, as I said, one of the most extreme environments that we, we face. Um, in, an, in another extreme environment, Nick, if we can move to you, um, if we can pass a, a microphone down. I had the dubious honour of moving cattle to uh, Queensland coastal valley during the drought, to keep them alive, and and um, you and it's a very we've got pretty extreme environments in Queensland. Um, your family have had a long experience selling bulls into um, different environments in Queensland, particularly uh, beyond the tick line. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit about how you select for for traits such as coat type and peat resilience, and and, and do you have um, I guess specific 
feedback from those clients in those uh, beyond the tick line. Yeah, thank you, Scott. Um, there's no doubt about it. Uh, slick coat type is a desirable um, trait that we look for um, in a bull, and I guess we have that in our female herd. So, um, so, so we do have a little bit of flexibility there with um, when we decide on our bull joinings, but. Uh, but yeah, a slick coat type does certainly help um, those bulls out in that in that environment. Um, just re restricting that environment for parasites to um, to to to, um, to to live on the on, on the heights. Um, and another thing is um, hooded eye seems to be another thing that uh, seems to work in a favour um, there to to protect the eyes um, more so on the progeny. Um, and feedback from clients, I, I guess every client is different, but uh, one thing that does ring true was is management um, and, uh, and set joining seems to be um, work in favour of longevity with bulls going out into um, the Queensland environment. Um, the, the, the year round joining does just put on extra pressure and, and therefore um, shortens the longevity of those bulls. Um, and I think added to that, uh, much similar to Frank, uh, the development that we do um, probably helps as well, um, cre um, creating a little bit more um, adversity through the development of the bulls before they go out. Um, we, we then can uh, select those bulls that probably shouldn't be bulls um, and, and, and prevent them from going out there to start with. So, um, so. Um, building that ad adversity um, in them before they go out um, seems to be uh, working in favour. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. Finally, James, um, you've uh, run a very successful operation on the, the mid-north coast um, environment or, or have a lot of clients in that area. Um, have you had to make specific uh, breeding decisions to um, adapt your cattle for that environment of, of I guess, moderate parasite pressure and, and high rainfall and those subtropical grasses? Um, yes, Scott. I suppose um, we're a little bit different than a lot of people on the coast. We've spent a lot of money on pastures, so we've got you know, better pastures than your average coastal uh, operation or a lot of our clients even. Um, and because of that, we probably like a little bit more growth ourselves. We aim our commercial steers at the feedlots. We, we've retained ownership of steers from feedlots, so we know the, the value of growth. Um, so sometimes we've got to temper that with our bulls for our clients if they don't have the similar pasture. We've got steep country, maybe not quite as steep as Forbes, but if you're spending a bit of time with our place, it'll have to be on a horse, Scott, not to, not a quad, because our country's too steep for quads, so Forbes obviously got some good tracks. But um, yeah, so it's steep country, and one of the issues I think we face going forward, which we probably didn't face in the in the past with uh, other breeds we're involved with, were, is just the longevity of our cows in that steep country. You know, we're, our cattle are growing bigger and faster and quicker, so we've got you know a lot of performance in them. But with that, obviously the structure is very important, and you know we're probably finding you know breakdowns in our cows probably a little bit earlier than we'd like. You know, but, you know they're, they're not getting to talk 14-year-old quarters as regularly as they'll probably they'll Devon short on cross cows to get in our hill country. So, but in saying that, there's a lot more performance building than the model these days. But uh, I suppose our challenge is is to. Um, maintain the structure and at the same time shift the, shift the performance of our cattle but keep it tempered for our clients that obviously don't have the, the um, grasses, the performance in their grasses like we do. Thanks James. You will have to find me a good horse, James. <laughs> <laughs> well they're all fit, they're, they're, they're used to carrying me to 10 and 9, but we'll find one. <laughs> Challenge is all there, Scott. <laughs> That's great. Um, I'll ask now a question to uh, the entire panel. Uh, it'd be good to get a, a variety of feedback there. Um, what does versatility look like today for the Angus breed? And more particularly, what do you think this will look like in 10 years' time? Um, okay, for, for me, I guess we're still sort of new to the Angus being Murray Gray breeders uh, traditionally and what Angus offers us and um, gives us confidence going forward is 
the depth of genetics that it offers um, and that consistency and reliability that we get from those genetics. Um, so for it, with the Murray Grays, we were pushing, trying to get the carcass weight sort of up to 300 kilos and pushing the growth and, and there probably wasn't the genetics to pick to get to that point and, and in, the, in the process of getting there we pushed the birth weight and the calving ease and ran into problems there. So what Angus offers us is the low birth weight sort of calving ease and then the growth and the performance and the, and the carcass weight at the end. So we can go and pick genetics from all over all these people's herds here and, and come up with a, a cow herd that suits our environment and our target market I guess. So for me, that's sort of what the versatility of the Angus offers it, us as a, as a business and as a growing business. And we want to be running more, more and more cows, essentially, and we can't be dealing with calving ease issues. Um, and, and we need the, the calves that we do get to hit those markets as consistently as we can get. Uh, to, to me, I feel that what, what we see here today with the panels um, a great demonstration of versatility. We have uh, a breed um, of breeders that we we all, you know, there's differing opinions here on, on how to breed cattle and what cattle we breed. And it's wonderful that we can all respect and appreciate the different opinions. And what that offers is a, a real variation in um, performance across the breed. So the ability to drive the rate of genetic gain is much higher when we have that variation within the breed. And I think the other thing that, um, to me, where Angus stands out in the Australian industry is we've been really keen to seek out how the genetics work through the value chain, right through the consumer, as opposed to just you know, working in our, in our own silo um, and breeding what might work for us. Because at the end of the day, there's got to be a slice of the pie for everyone all the way through the value chain, and importantly, the consumer is what matters because they're the only ones that are putting any money into the value chain. And if they stop doing that, then our industry fails to survive. Um, I see diversity in this breed where um, the Angus is um, produced over lots of different types of uh, areas in Australia. Um, we need to uh, keep focused on uh, the female and uh, the longevity of our program and keep uh, progressing that way and uh, look after our cow herd. I basically have to agree with the three panellists so far. Uh, Angus uh, is a maternal breed, so we can't lose sight of the fact that we've got our easy calving back in calf. Calving is a two-year-old back in calf annually, rearing a good calf. And then when you've got those things, structure is part of it too. And when you've got those things together, you can start count, uh, concentrating on uh, your um, things like carcass traits and uh, eatability marbling and things like that. So um, hopefully we're at the stage now where we're concentrating on those things now. And because um, we've got the uh, forerunners of that all place now, so uh, yeah, hopefully it's uh, onwards and upwards with us. Yeah, I think everything's covered there for me. I think, yeah, everyone else has covered what I was going to say, so. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, yeah, I guess for us um, and, and why we chose Angus was particularly that was, was the predictability and the accuracy that's out there with genetics. Um, much like ourselves, our clients now are able to design cattle um, that suit what they're doing, um, not only their environment, but what they're trying to do. So, um, so as we get down the track with more and more accuracy, it's only making that job easier. Um, probably similar with us, we moved towards Angus now 25 years ago, and that's been a, you know, a gradual process. We've still got some red cows in the herd. Um, not many, but they're, they're still there. Um, the, the versatility of the breed was what attracted to us, and I suppose when we think about it, you know, breed average in the Angus is pretty damn good. We don't want to lose sight of that. Um, I know as humans, we're always trying to jump higher and run faster, and we're doing that when we select our cattle. We, 
we can be prone probably to chase extremes. Um, and, you know, looking at graphs and figures, that's something that, um, that you know, probably chases that way a bit. But I think what's pretty important that we keep in mind uh, was this, uh, our focus on the fact that breed averages in the Angus breed is what's put the Angus breed, you know, it's probably the number one breed in Australia at the moment because it does most things really well. Um, and so we want to retain those things. And I, I know the scientists will cringe when, when I say this, but I think the, the thing, some of the things we don't measure, like the sale yard traits, and you know, I call that good, strong head and jaw and strong tops, and, and they're the things that makes Angus breeds make the top price in the sale yards. Um, we don't want to lose sight of that because you know, sale yards, to some extent, drive our industry. Um, it's only in the middle part of the chain, but that's where that's where everyone focuses on, you know, what cattle are selling well, and and that's where the, the commercial producer sees his return in, in most cases. Um, and so we don't want to lose sight that the Angus breed has been really strong at breed average and, and, and achieving those results in the sale yards for commercial clients. And um, whilst the study and the industry, we are always going to try and push those extremes and make them better, um, we don't want to lose sight of the things that made the Angus breed you know, in, the, in Australia today. So to dig in a little bit further, um, where, if we fast forward 10 years, where do you think we need to concentrate our thinking going forward in 10 years' time? Yeah, I think, um, I think much like uh, James is mentioning there, um, a lot of it probably, um, to me, we, we've got it good as it is now. Um, that, that doesn't mean... Um, there's no need for progression, but, um, but we, we've really got to um, appreciate what we've, where, where we've got to now and, and, and the tools that we've got, um, I, I think, to move forward and, and pretty similar to, to, where, um, um, to where Frank was mentioning that the, uh, the end consumer really is um, an, an important part of it. So to, um, to, to improve or, uh, or create more choice there, um, then it, it just flows all the way down through, um, and, uh, and 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 to a point, it, it comes to, um, to to create its own momentum. And, and, and when you've got a um, a system that, that creates its own momentum and its own demand, it um, it, it really is puts it out of reach. And um, yeah, I think that's um, that would be a, a strong advantageous point um, for the Angus breed. Anyone else like to um, to add to that? Where where we'll be thinking in a particular ten years' time? Well, I guess um, coming from WA, I'm pretty new to the whole Angus on a national level. Meeting all you guys a lot for the first time, and from maybe I'm naive, but it seems like it's quite a close knit family, and everyone gets on quite well. So, from my point of view, in ten years' time, I'd like to think that it still stays this way um, and that, uh, you know, things like the index thing that happened a few years ago, that, that had a little bit of a rift effect from my viewpoint and, and I think that if we can keep in mind protecting what, what the members want at the minute in terms of, um, you know, there's that diversity there and, and everyone breeds differently, but I'd like to see it sort of all stay together. So what we're doing now seems to be pretty good from my point of view, and I'd like to see that in 10 years' time. Uh, I'd like to um, thank the direction that Angus Australia have taken. I think their marketing is A class. Uh, we're the envy of many other breeds at the moment. Uh, there's plenty of backlash on Angus at the moment um, for their marketing campaign. So I think, and I'm really impressed with your um, mission statement last night, Angus for every system. I think that is just awesome. That's been something, it's been our backbone for a long time that doesn't matter whether you're producing vealers, steers, heifers, cows, bullocks. Back in you know, uh, earlier days when bullocks were a big focus, but not so now. But um, we've always uh, um, preached that, that Angus did every system, whatever your market was, whatever part of Australia you're in, you they will work for you. Um, 
It's been a wonderful breed and I look forward to the pathways that the society will take us in the next 10 years. Uh, we're both very excited for the development and the leadership. Um, so yeah, we wish you all the very best um, with keeping the Angus breed at the very top of the tree. Um, just one thing I noticed, we were at a, a feedlot the other day and um, the guy there said, well, the steers, which were, in my opinion, overfat already and they're still on feed, but they're only dressing out at 54 or 50 to 56%, I think, um, in that range to be 54 to 56%, the range must be 50 to 60%. Um, I think that uh, the breeders need feedback, like all those animals identified, that the stud breeders need feedback on those uh, feedlots, cattle throughout New Zealand. We haven't got a feedlot industry in New Zealand, but they should be getting feedbacks because it's really the ones that are the 60% of yield ones that you want to be um, focusing on as long as they're good for the other traits. Uh, that's one thing. In New Zealand, on our grass-fed stuff, ours uh, at 18 to 20, 24 months, uh, uh, yielding 58, 57, 58, 59 percent straight off grass, and they are not they are not grossly fat at all. Like their uh, rib fats are probably around 8 to 12 mils, and we're getting a lot higher yield. So, uh, and this something that I think that's something that, that uh, Angus Australia can really concentrate on like measure 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 is the important thing and if you've got traits that can be improved the uh, carcass yield is something that uh, I think could really be improved in Australia that's my opinion. Uh, it, it, I think it's important to keep what we can achieve in perspective um, to what we have achieved, because as James said, down the breed, if we look um, specifically at performance, breed average is high. Um, if we look at what Angus Australia achieves as an organisation, you've set a high standard. So, I think what we we have to be a bit careful of is um, there's a lot there's a lot in the space now of genetics, and we heard a lot yesterday about emissions, and you know that's a new space for us. But making sure that we don't lose sight of the fundamentals of of running cattle, um, you know, commercially that are going to be profitable through the, the whole supply chain. So, a lot of the things we're looking at now, as a breed and as industry, are ones and two percenters, and it's making sure we don't lose sight of the tens and twenty percent um, areas because they're the ones that they'll drive profitability a lot harder than what the one and two percenters will. And, and you alluded to that there, Frank. I think is got new traits being explored all the time. Admissions. Obviously, NFI grass, um, and, and we've just got to be careful what effect that's going to have on our Angus breed. If, if you know, the industry or you know the the world in general wants us to be you know really focused on emissions, we want to make sure that, um, that when we start to measure it, that we don't actually you know destroy some of the other good things within the breed. And that, that that's going to be that's confronting us you know in the short term that that we're going to be put in a position where um, there's going to be some selection pressure put on things like emission and, and we've just got to be careful I think to see what it does to the to the rest of the breed or the rest of the breed's abilities. You can just um, maybe take a, a slightly different tack. Um, we we launched our new uh, five-year strategic plan yesterday um, there's some figures in that document um, 25 years ago there was roughly three and a half thousand bulls uh, Angus bulls sold at auction um, across Australia and we, last year we just sold uh, just short of 12,000 uh, Angus bulls at auction. Um, we've got a line up here of uh, a group of breeders and you all have um, highly successful businesses and, um, and sell a lot of genetics. Um, so if I can ask you all, um, we talk about blue ocean markets. Where uh, a blue ocean market, is the, where do we go now in terms of uh, market potential moving forward? Where do each of you see the next chapter of growth for the Angus breed in terms of markets? Yeah, I think um, I, I keep connecting or, or relating to the, to the shelf product and, um, 
and providing more choice there. Um, I, I think um, it, it was something that I, um, I picked up on early on was that the agricultural um, bubble ha ha has its has a certain extent of, um, of of money that's in there already, and and, and it, it's there. But to to, um, to 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 create more money within that bubble, it's it's the the only way that it comes in there is, is through the consumer. Um, and, and and so I, I think for us to um, be, become more profitable or, or or make things easier for us um, in the production chain is to um, is is to create more choice there for for a consumer. Um, that they are willing to to, um, to put more or pay more for for a certain product. Um, what what that is um, is it, certainly up to the consumer. But uh, but but I think um, yeah, that's where I see. Um, and then and, and 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 follows on probably with what I was alluding to there before was um, what well, was creating that once it gets that momentum going, it it, it creates its own demand and. Um, and, and, and therefore seen a valuation effect. I think uh, one of those opportunities has been spoken about quite a bit the last couple of days, the beef on dairy, and um, Liz Pearson was down in Tassie maybe two months ago and really stumbled across the opportunity. She went to see a processor and stumbled across the opportunity, and I, I reckon it's probably dominated Liz's workload over the, since that time. So. We've done a little bit of work in that space as a business. Um, been in Tassie where there's lots of dairy, there's some opportunities there. And I think there's a notion that, um, you know, dairy is a dirty word when it comes to beef production. The reality is, as a breed, Angus can really offer some value because one thing we have that a lot of other breeds don't have is really predictable genetic outcomes. And the dairy industry thrives on data. They make all their decisions on data. They measure every day. They can make really powerful decisions um, every day with their production. Um, so data is going to really drive the decision making for them. So if we don't do it um, as a breed, someone else has to come in and try and do it. And I don't think the outcomes is good for the dairy industry and for, uh, for the industry as a whole. In, in New Zealand, uh, the dairy industry, like this, they don't want to kill uh, bobby calves anymore. There's a, you know, so there's a huge opportunity in New Zealand in the dairy industry, uh, especially with sex semen. Like dairy farmers can pick out however many uh, replacement heifers they need, uh, use heifer, uh, sex heifer semen over them, and um, the rest can go to beef bulls. So there's a huge opportunity there. The beef industry in New Zealand is. Uh, Pathetic, really. On average, we only got an 82% uh, calving rate, so there's huge opportunities there for improvement. And um, hopefully, Angus Breen can um, do a good job in that respect as well. Well, I guess from my point of view, the like I've spoken about, the southern rangelands is a is an area to push into and figure out exactly the the type of cattle that work there. Um, so I think that probably comes from the breeders to, to figure that out and, and um, maybe if Angus Australia were involved in, in maybe help, helping to figure out what type of animal works there in the target markets that, that are suited to those cattle. So yeah, aside from dairy on beef, which does seem to be a very exciting um, prospect that that's an area in WA that we, we can work on, I think. And look, I think the opportunities to the Angus breed are, are to increase our IMF across the breed. I know at the pointy end we've got really high IMF, but probably in the commercial industry breed average, there's still there's plenty of work to do there. Um, again, if we think about emissions, you know, there's going to be pressure on the Wagyu industry who are at the very extreme end of IMF for 30 to 350 days. So, if we can shift our, um, our Angus in 150 day to 180 day product back to 130 days, we're still going to marble score four, which seems to be the, the benchmark where those programs want to be um, as a rule of thumb. Um, I think the Jack Street program, I was in there on Wednesday for the Jack Street program, I think you know they, they really want a three. I think their, their averages that I've seen are around 2.9, I think, so they're still asking us, they want more IMF. So, 
Um, and, and we track all our steers through that. We've got size, an average 3.6, 3.7. We've also had bulls that go through that have average 2.1, which are under us. So I think the industry, the Angus industry as a whole, I think we don't want to take a take us away from IMF while still you know, acknowledging the other, the other good traits as we take with it. Because um, we're seeing, finally, it's I know they were talking about when I was a boy, but there is value-based marketing happening slowly. JBS in their grass-fed program give you a 40 cent premium for a, a carcass that Marble score four. Um, they're, they're now talking actually of, of increasing that premium to 60 cents and having a 20 cent premium if you can do a three. So. Again, the focus from them is they want, you know, they're worried about their consumers. As Frank said, um, they're finding that product very easy to sell. They're getting prepared to pay people for for, for that uh, higher IMF off, off in the grass situation. And, and so, yeah, I think um, from our perspective, we we you know going to keep focusing on that IMF and not but not try and lose some of the traits that uh, that you know make Angus cattle great. Um, one little thing that my clients up in uh, northern pasture areas and out around Alice Springs is getting their head around the EBVs and all that for what they need to produce. That's the big question every time they rock up at the bull sale. What figures am I supposed to be looking at? So I suppose uh, one thing for the breed would be good to, I suppose, hold a workshop or something like that up in those areas to be able to explain to them more what they should be looking, looking for, I guess. Last question um, to the whole panel is, um, what do you think you need from the society um, in 10 years that doesn't, 10 years from now that doesn't exist today? I'm probably not answering the question what we what I need, but I think we've got to be really careful, Scott, um, how we challenge our staff. Um, if you wind the clock back 10 years, I don't know what's an inventory for 33, $34, whatever it is, 24, whatever. And so it's 20, 10 years we we're asking for $24 with, you know, a big start at AI, 100 heifers, and then put a backup bull in three different mobs, you know, a couple of weeks later, and then, and then at registration time, send, send in their, you know, their predictions, and you might find out of those 100, there's two or three wrong, but they've made a wrong decision with, um, with what the calf was by, but, you know, three out of 100, the staff can fix that, and, and everyone's happy the cal calves are registered. Now we're finding six time AI, you know, that 100 heifers AI, and then, you know, six or seven cub bulls are put out with them, and some of those bulls are probably full brothers, and we're saying to our staff, um, you know, well, can you work them out for us, please? And, and still for $24. And, and I think it was Ben yesterday from SC Genetics, is it Ben, is it? Sorry, I missed that. You know, he said, well, the next step is that we're, we're going to AI those 100 heifers with straws of semen, we've got three bulls in the straw, and then back them up with the six cub bulls. And we're going to say to our staff, now for $24, can you work those 100 calves out for us, please? And, you know, the, that's, that's where the industry moving at pace. And, and, and we're expecting our office staff to keep up with that, those demands. And then you add the genomics into it but the whole time. So what, the industry's changing that fast, and we're still only paying $24 for that service. And um, we're expecting that service to, you know, to just jump high, jump over higher bars all the time. And um, I think that's a, probably a challenge for the board to try and work out how to keep on doing that. But uh, you know, it's if if we just sit still um, for, if at a board level, and, and I won't be on the board in a few years' time. But that, you know, the challenge is to face, to face the board just how we how we allow our staff to to keep you know providing the service that's been tremendous over the last few years as we place bigger demands on them. Yeah, I think probably probably fairly similar um, in, in that uh, yeah to, to change too much just creates probably too much more complexity. I, I think it is good the way it is now. I'm, I'm really impressed with the R and D work that goes on. Um, we, we are creating more and more efficiencies. Um, the, the, the immune index um, it is a great example. I, I think that that'll be a, a, a huge breakthrough in terms of efficiencies. Um, for not only us, but um, our clients. Uh, I'd like to follow up from James and uh, uh, definitely the uh, staff at Angus Australia. They have had to uh, cope with a huge amount of workload over the last few years with uh, all the DNA testing, uh, which is just 
uh, been a, such a great tool for our breeding program. Um, when I um, started in this, it was just a breed society. Now it's a large company that we're dealing with. The society plays a major role um, to the Angus breed. It has to um, service its members, and the members are then got to be uh, focusing on the commercial person, to our clients, to the markets. Um, so it's a very real important role. We need really great leadership at the top end so it allows down at grassroot level to get the message out to uh, the consumer, I suppose. Another area I think that's really important is the youth program. Um, Angus Youth Roundup has been a huge part of our life and it has given me so much great pleasure over the years uh, to see these young people that the Angus program has put through and where they've gone on today and holding high roles in lots of different fields of work. I had the pleasure last night in speaking to one of our young speakers yesterday in the panel and she has not come from a farming background at all but talking with her last night she said oh this is just like a big family she said i feel so connected and so happy to have been involved here today and she wished she could have been here tomorrow now her career path she's hoping that she could one day actually be able to be involved with the angus breed so that she can have that connection back to the family and I thought, well, that's fantastic. That's what we're doing for young people. And we've done it for a long time and um, mighty proud of that. And I hope um, that's where I'd like to see the society and really keep focusing on the young people because it is the future. So that's my thoughts. We're offering a service um, that improves our reliability, uh, improves the Angus product but we have to make sure that how we've got to where we have is maintained in that genomic testing can potentially reduce the need for um, taking phenotypic measurements. And as a um, business that employs staff, uh, workplace health and safety is a strong consideration of ours and the most dangerous job we do as a team is tagging calves. Um, if we stop tagging calves and we all stop tagging calves, then the accuracy in the product over time diminishes. So I think it's important. At the moment, it's a level playing field. Um, if, if you do genomic testing um, and you don't do any phenotype, you say pay the same price as the, as the member who does both. So I think it's worthwhile considering we reward the herds that are prepared to offer uh, the data that's going to help maintain or, or continue to improve the accuracy of the product moving forward? I think that um, Angus as a breed over the last 30, 40 years has been definitely the most progressive and uh, adopt, adopting new technologies and I guess moving with the times and it's uh, staying quite exciting. So talking to James the other night, I think when they made the switch to Angus, it was an exciting breed to be in. It was progressive and I think for me and, and other young people, it, it is still an exciting and progressive breed to be in and the new ideas that are adopted and, and jumping on new technology. So I think um, if that can continue on, that when the new opportunities and ideas and technologies come up, that Angus embraces it and communicates with the members to adopt it um, you, you know, in a sensible fashion that it, it, we can continue to keep the breed exciting and progressive and, and a target for, for young people. We've got um, about six minutes before we, we break for morning tea. Um, I'd just like to ask either any of the panellists that would like to ask a question of another panellist or anyone from the floor if you'd like to um, ask a question now. I think we've got a couple of mics that are available. Uh, so we don't have a hugely accurate genetic tool to select a pope type. So my question is to all of you in general, perhaps not you folks, um, how are you selecting for coat type at a genetic level? Uh, 
Anyone love to keep it open? Suppose, yeah, I'm always looking at that from when the calf's born to when it's a, a, a wiener. It's the first thing I'm always looking at, the, the, how the bull is going to grow out and to make sure that it doesn't have a, a coarse coat um, and make sure I follow the, the cow line or the bull line back to, and track it down to how I can get it as fine and as slick and, and I, as I can because that's, that's my main my main market um, to where all my clients are, and they're heavily focused on that type of thing. So yeah, I'm always keep an eye on the same as when I look in the salmon catalogues and, and anyone's bull sale catalogues. I quickly flip through them as soon as I see a nice slick coated shiny one, I start looking at everything else. So that's the way I think it is. There is a research EBV for, for coat type, but it measures length. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Christian, um, just length rather than nesting type. Is that correct? Rather than softness or pliability or whatever, which I also think is important. You know, the long-term cattlemen are attracted to those cattle that are, you know, just not just not short skin, but in a soft skin. And you might like to add to that, Christian. Um, I, I, I kept getting a. Uh, off down at consultant level, but yeah, there is a research EBV for coat type. Yeah, so we've got a uh, research EBV out there for coat type. Um, it's going really well. We've got about nearly 20,000 phenotypes coming in now. It's genomically enhanced as well, single step, um, self so safety selection. Um, we're still working out correlations with other traits and things, so I'm um, going to do that work before we make it a full EBV. But it's there for selection. It does, does work on a standard scoring system, which essentially looks at coat length, I guess you could say, but um, takes in a few attributes and such. So it's definitely yeah. worthwhile looking at if you're interested in coat type, rather than just uh, visually assessing an animal, which is still important, um, look at the genetic information as well, which we've be, we got available through Angus Tech. If you need to know any more, come and talk to us. Do we have any other questions from, from the floor? Quite a crowd this morning. Another, another question? Yes. So, back on to um, coat type. Um, so, yeah, there is a research EBV, but the accuracy is an issue there. Um, so, a few of you uh, mentioned clients selecting for coat type, Unix, so I'll direct my question to you. So um, clients are looking at, they're looking for the bull with the slick coat, or they're looking for that to go through to progeny. Like, is it a focus on both, or it's really just the slick bull that they're after? Yeah, I think uh, uh, the direct answer to your question would be uh, uh, on, on sale day, that, that's what they're looking at. Um, that's all that they can look at. and. Um, but for them, um, the, the benefit is in their progeny. So, um, so they don't know that before the, before the progeny gets on the ground. But certainly on sale day, that, that's that's the only um, tool they can use at the moment is um, is, is the raw uh, the visual appearance of the of the animal. Um, and so, what we'll see in a in, in a group of bulls, um, if if there's a hundred bulls there on the day, that there's a preference to the bulls that have the, the shorter and slick hair coat and the softer skin. Um, whereas uh, when, when it, in, in, the, in the tougher years, when, when, when bulls go straight through the ring, is, um, is, it's generally those ones that have got the, uh, the raw, raw type um, coats. Yeah. Yeah. Does that uh, get close? Question down the back. Yeah, thank you. Um, across all of your different environments that you all operate in, where in Australia would you describe as a low feed cost environment? And what is your perspective on the trade-off between managing mature cow weight um, for reducing feed costs and increasing the turnoff weight of those cows? Well, I suppose it's a sweet spot in whichever country you uh, are, Hamish. Um, um, we don't make any fodder in our country, it's too steep. Um, so um, only buy fodder in, in, you know, in the worst part of the drought. Um, 
and you know we maintained all our cows at you know a conception rate dropped down in 2018 and 19 when our rainfall two years in a row was below half of what it normally is um, and still kept our conceptions at sort of 86 to 88 percent um, with probably feeding 20 percent of our cows in that time um, so we, we manage our grasses to, conser to conserve it so we haven't got a, a lot of feed gaps i mentioned before we like growth and, and I think there's a sweet spot depending in your country and depending on where you are, you know, the, the sweet spot Branson on the, at the Branson I'm guessing is, is probably a bit higher, you know, it might be a 350 carcass weight cow. For us it's around a 300 to 330 carcass weight cow when we salvage it. And we've got to keep a, a, an eye on, well, we, we've got to keep an eye on that if you're in a self-replacing female situation, which most, most commercial blokes are, about 30% of the income from your, from your cow or female salvage. So if we drive that into the ground too much on, in, in, and try and bend the curve too hard, we'll lose at the other end. And that's you know, 300 kilos is the top carcass. Uh, that's where you get the premium for, for your, your cow salvage. And, and the other reason to like that, if you're in the, a, an industry like we are, where the majority of Angus cattle get fed probably for 150 days, um, you need enough growth in that feedlot phrase so they don't get too fat, like Forbes was saying yesterday. So if they can still growing in 150 days after going on feed at, in our case, about 14 months, so we need that growth to keep going till they're, you know, they're, they're getting killed at about two year old um, or just a little bit before. Um, so, um, yeah, it's, it's horses for courses in your country and it's going to change throughout Australia um, and depends on how much feed you conserve and prepared to make for your cattle, whether you conserve it in the paddock or you conserve it in the shed. Um, and possibly, you know, if you've got a lot harder country, you do need a, lo a, lo a lower uh, mature cow weight. Um, but, you know, it's, it's about the market you're aiming at, I suppose, and the, and the country you live in. I'm not sure that answered it, but... Jamie and I, in our environment, um, in the, especially in the commercial herd, I guess, our theory's always been the fertility sort of drives what size cow we're going to end up. And the big, framier, big, heavy, mature cow, the mature weight cows just, you know, fall out of calves and, and naturally we find the sweet spot for our environment. Um, and WA, I suppose, is renowned for having slightly bigger cows, um, but it all comes down to the environment that they run in, like our James's cows, they were staring down at me from a hill, um, whereas we're, we're pretty flat um, and, and high production system. So that's where it works in our environment. But going forward, I'd love to be able to figure out what the most grass efficient cow is. Um, I don't really know how you do that, measuring how much intake a cow's eating grass and, and weight gains and, and find out what the sweet spot is economically, but that's a real area of interest going forward is to work out how to how to come up with that that best best answer. Probably just gone slightly over time. Um, so we might uh, wrap it up there. I'd just like to uh, thank you all for um, coming up and being part of the, the panel um, this morning. If uh, any of you uh, have got any more questions, uh, our Please search out these guys um, through the rest of the day at morning tea or lunch. Um, but thank you all for being a part of it. Um, our new uh, vision statement going forward is Angus for every system. And um, across the, the stage here, that's well represented this morning. So thank you all. We've got a gift just in a moment um, that I'll, I'll hand to each of you before you go to morning tea. I'd like to thank James um, and the NOLA team for um, providing and sponsoring morning tea this morning. So please, in a moment, uh, go out to the gardens and, and enjoy that. Just a couple of things. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, welcome to the conference this morning. We've got the, the CEO of um, Beef Australia, Simon Irwin. He'll, he'll speak to us just after lunch um, and, then, and then he'll be leaving. So if uh, any of you would like to um, uh, seek Simon out during the, the course of the morning and have a chat about uh, beef next year, please, please do that. Um, and also, just a reminder, we've got our member services team outside um, today, so if you've got any questions or anything that's been difficult to solve, please uh, find the team uh, just through the doors there, and if you've got a difficult registration question or a DNA question, or if you can't find one of those sores, James, uh, please go and find the team and, and they'll certainly help you out. So um, we'll, uh, we'll break for morning tea and 
Uh, thank you for your attention and, and uh, if we could come back in at 10.30 this morning. Thanks everyone.